Good morning. Welcome to Online Worship at Shepherd of the Hills. It is great to have you with us here today and join us for worship as we gather together around God's word and praising our Savior, Jesus Christ. This morning's service continues our series, Everyday Joy, and in particular, we'll focus on the theme, Jesus is greater than me. In our message, we see the Apostle Paul give to us words of guidance as we evaluate the priorities and the things that we we value in our lives and how that compares with our relationship with God and how when we believe that Jesus is greater than me, that changes everything and how we view things in our life. We continue our service with our readings from God's Word. Uh, you can follow along in your online worship folder, which is on our website, in the description of our video, and, and also in your email inbox. The first reading is from Judges chapter 7. In this account, we meet a man named Gideon, and he was given the task of going to battle against Israel's enemy, and he was to face the Midianites. Now, Gideon was started out with a huge group of people, but God chose only 300 men to go into battle to show that their power came not from them, but from God. And it was God who was always with them to give them the victory, and not to take credit for themselves. We read from Judges chapter 7. The Lord said to Gideon, You have too many men for me to deliver Midian into their hands, in order that Israel may not boast against me that her own strength has saved her. Announce now to the people, Anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left, while 10,000 remained. But the Lord said to Gideon, There are still too many men. Take them down to the water, and I will sift them for you there. If I say, there, this one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say, this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So Gideon took the men down to the water. There the Lord told him, Separate those who lap the water with their tongues like a dog from those who kneel down to drink. Three hundred men lapped with their hands to their mouths. All the rest got down on their knees to drink. The Lord said to Gideon, With the three hundred men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the other men go, each to his own place. So Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites to their tents, but kept the three hundred who took over the provisions and trumpets of the others. This is the word of our God. The verse of the day is from Hebrews chapter 11. Alleluia. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Alleluia. Our gospel reading for today is from Matthew chapter 13. In these verses we see Jesus give two parables to us, two different stories, but they both have the same meaning. And Jesus is, is showing you and me the greatest treasure that we can have in our life is the message of the gospel is, salvation and forgiveness of sins that Jesus Christ has given to us. And as we have this great gift of God in our lives, may we never, never take it for granted, may we never lose it, but may we hold it near and dear to our hearts. We read, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. We join in confessing our Christian faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue with our children's message this morning. 
Good morning, kids. And thank you once again for joining us in online worship today. In our reading we, we just heard a little bit ago, Jesus told a story uh, about a man who, who bought a field and then also a, a merchant who was kind of like a businessman. He, he found a great pearl. And it tells us that these people, they found something so valuable, they sold everything they had. What's something that is very valuable to you? Uh, maybe it's, it's, it's some Legos that you have. Uh, maybe it could be um, some video games. Or, or maybe it, it's something that's been given to you by someone else. Maybe your grandparents and it's really valuable and important to you and you don't, don't want to lose it. Uh, there's a number of things that can be, be valuable to us. When I was a little kid, or younger I should say, what was really important and valuable to me was my collection of baseball cards. And I would check how much they were worth in these magazines that would tell you how much each card is worth. And it was really important to me, and I would trade different cards to try to get better ones, and I would keep them in this book and all organized. Uh, but as I got older, those, those cards, although they have some value to them, they are not really that important to me. I have them in a box somewhere stored, and I haven't seen them in who knows how long. As you grow up, there'll be other things that change in how important and valuable they are to you. And maybe you'll, you'll like Legos your entire life. And you know what? That's cool. But maybe as you get older, you know, some of the toys you had that you think are really valuable and important, you know, they're maybe not that important anymore. Some of the video games that you spent a lot of time playing with, as you get older, maybe you don't play with them that much. There's one thing of greatest value, greatest treasure that we've been given is Jesus. And, and that value never changes because Jesus is the most important thing we could have. And that's why in those stories, we're reminded not to let anything get in the way, but to do everything we can to have that treasure, to have that pearl and hold it with us the rest of our life. So stay close to Jesus and read God's word. Come to church, watch worship online, and hold on to that treasure God has given to you, a Savior, the forgiveness of sins, an eternal home in heaven, things that will last forever. And because Jesus is our awesome Savior, it means that those things will never be taken from you. Let's close from a prayer, with a prayer. And dear Jesus, uh, we thank you for showing to us what is the most important thing in our lives. It is you. May we always treat you as the most important and valuable part of our life. May we stay close to your word and keep you in our hearts because you have forgiven us all of our sins and you have given us an eternal home in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I am the greatest. I'm the greatest thing that ever lived. Do you recognize that quote? It's a little bit dated, so, so maybe not, but those words were spoken by famous boxer Muhammad Ali after he defeated Sonny Liston in 1964. Even though those words were, were spoken over 50 years ago, they still remain relevant to us in our world right now. And because there are still people today aspiring to greatness and trying to be great in different areas of, of their lives. And maybe you see motivational posters that say, you are destined for greatness. If you go online, you can find a bunch of websites and, and even books that will give you the steps or the key to unlock your greatness. But what does being great even mean? or look like. I'm guessing if you asked a random group of people, you'd probably hear quite a few responses that are regarding our earthly lives. Like being great is being successful, having a good job, maybe a, a special title, being recognized a celebrity or being popular, uh, being wealthy or living in a certain type of house or having a certain type of car. But people might also say that certain qualities is what makes a person great. You're a leader. You're driven. You do not accept anything less than the best. You don't settle. You're a competitor. Now, when you look at all these different ideas and kind of put them together, you tend to find these things in common when it comes to greatness from a worldly perspective. 
It's all about who you are, what you have done, and what you have accomplished. And now, as we get into our text this morning, the Apostle Paul is addressing a problem in the Philippian church. And the core of this problem is regarding the idea of of who we are and, and what we do. Does that make us better to God? And so Paul shows the Philippians and us a lesson, a very important lesson, about our priorities and what we value and what that has to do with our relationship with God. And he shows us how understanding that Jesus is greater than me changes how we view everything. And so we turn to Philippians chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. Again, we see Paul reiterate the theme of his book, joy, expressing the joy that is his through Christ and encouraging the Philippians to join in rejoicing to God. And he continues, watch out, or excuse me, it is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard to you. So Paul addresses the purpose for writing these verses in chapter 3. He is doing this to help the Philippians. He calls it a safeguard. He was writing these words to protect them and to make sure that they stay in the truth of God's word. And still today, the Bible is a safeguard for you and me in our lives, both physically and spiritually. When God's word is preached, taught, and read, uh, well, then it alerts us to corrections we need to make in our lives, or maybe sins that we've committed. But it also alerts us to false teachings and errors that can exist. So we see right away that, that Paul is saying there's danger for the Philippian Christians. And here's why. Look at what he says in verse 2. Watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. Very strong words from Paul. And typically when we think of dogs, they are gentle and kind pets. They are our companions. But in Paul's time, dogs did not have that, that connotation or association. Uh, dogs were running wild in the streets of Philippi, roaming and, and scavengers throughout the city. And generally speaking, people looked down upon the animal and treated it as a contemptible creature. So, it, it's an insult to call someone a dog, but in Paul's context here, we see that it carries a much more intense and disparaging emphasis. And, and here's why Paul says this. Because they are men who do evil. There was no hint in good of what they were doing. Their actions were going to result in, in hurting others. And so Paul says, watch out, be on your guard, beware, because these people are going to hurt you. And that brings us to the first point on our message notes. Watch out for those trying to rob the gospel. The dogs or evildoers that Paul is talking about here are false teachers. In other books of the Bible, they're called Judaizers. And who they were were Christians from a Jewish background. And they insisted, to be a Christian, you need to follow all of the Old Testament laws. And you need to do all of these things to be a true believer. And so if a Gentile became a convert to Christianity, they would have to be circumcised. They would have to avoid eating special kinds of food, unclean animals like pork and different types of fish. And they had to avoid all of these laws. Judaizers said that you had to live this way in order to be saved. They believed Jesus was the Son of God, but in reality, they were teaching that what Jesus did wasn't enough. You need to do something too. It was work righteousness. And throughout the Christian, history of the Christian church, there have been a number of false teachings that had this work righteousness philosophy, this idea that we can do something to save ourselves, or that we need to do certain things to be a true Christian. And this has happened for centuries. And you will see with work righteousness, it always has this idea behind it. It elevates me and lowers God. It tries to bring us up to God's level and show that we are great people. And that's an attractive concept to a sinful nature that tells us you're really not that sinful. 
You're not as bad as those other people. You can do something to save yourself. If you just try a little bit harder, you keep these rules, these laws, you do enough good works, God will have to let you into heaven. The reason why Paul spoke so strongly was because he knew what was at stake, the gospel. And these false teachers were corrupting the gospel and and they were going to do great harm to people's souls, maybe even destroy their faith. And the reason why the gospel was at stake was because if you follow this false teaching to its logical conclusion, you will find that Jesus was not the all-sufficient Savior. He gave you a good start, but now you have to do the rest. Martin Luther once said, Grace, if grace depended upon our cooperation, then it is no longer grace. This teaching was robbing the Philippians of the greatest treasure God has given to them and to us. Salvation through faith in Jesus. And so now Paul shows the difference between these false teachers and and himself and the Philippian Christians. He says in verse 3, For it is we who are the circumcision, we who worship by the Spirit of God, we who glory in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. Those false teachers, they were not worshiping by the Spirit of God, but they were essentially worshiping the the Spirit of me. The glory was not in Christ, but in themselves. And all the confidence wasn't put in God, but in them and what they could do. And Paul says, clearly, that is not who we are or what we believe. Our confidence, our glory is in Christ. Next, Paul breaks down why who we are And what we have done cannot make us great before God. He says in verse 4, Though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, As for legalistic righteousness, faultless. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. And that takes us to the next point on our message notes. Everything we have or accomplish is a loss compared to Christ. Now, the Apostle Paul was telling the Judaizers that whatever qualifications, criteria, or accomplishments they have, he exceeds them all. And when it comes to his Jewish background, he was circumcised on the eighth day, like the command God gave to Abraham. He could trace his Jewish heritage back to the tribe of Benjamin. Now, why that's important is because Jewish people in Paul's day couldn't necessarily trace their, their family lineage after the tribes of Israel kind of were scattered, scattered around, some people could not name their family's history, but Paul himself could. As far as religious background, he was a Pharisee and not an idle one. He was persecuting the church. He was, he was zealous in following all the Pharisaical laws. Now, Paul wasn't saying these things to boast about himself, but really he was, he was doing the opposite. He was showing the Judaizers that he can beat them at their own game. But more importantly, he was teaching them this is the wrong game altogether because those things are useless when it comes to our spiritual life. Oh, who we are and those things they had done, they can't make them better to God. And and they certainly couldn't save them because they're sinful. It's like Isaiah tells us, all our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. And so Paul says, whatever it was my profit, I consider loss for the sake of Christ. Now, Paul is teaching you and me uh, an important lesson about our priorities and the things we value in life and and how they can be a detriment to our faith. For the Judaizers, 
to them, it was all about obeying these laws so that they can look good to God and they can earn a way to heaven. But they failed to see their sinfulness. And as a result, they thought saving themselves could be done. But in reality, they were throwing away the work of Christ and his forgiveness and salvation. What are some things we maybe consider as a prophet to us? Maybe things you have done or accomplished. Maybe your education. Uh, Perhaps your career path. Uh, Maybe your retirement. Or possibly uh, looking to how hard a worker you are. Or how good a student you are. How good of a parent I am. Uh, Maybe we think about uh, spiritual things. How long I've been a Christian. How frequently I go to church. How many times and ways I've served my Lord. How many times I've helped other people. Now, I'm not saying these things are wrong in and of themselves. In fact, God's word tells us to do many of them. But what I I want you to think about is what is our motivation behind them? Is it ever me? Making myself look better or make myself feel better? Do we ever think that doing these things is so important that doing them makes us better to God or better people. If that's happened, then we have not considered them a loss for Christ. Now, Paul isn't telling us that we need to get rid of, of everything we have, but he is telling us that these things are not as important or as great as Christ is. Now, now these verses may be a scary thought for some people. Because it may mean letting go of some things they don't want to. Or maybe they have this fear that letting go of their significance means that they may lose their identity or who they are. But Paul is showing us when we consider these things a loss, we're really not losing anything at all compared to Christ. And that's the last point on our notes Jesus, only Jesus, gives us the righteousness we truly need. Look at what Paul says in verse 8. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. In these verses, the Apostle Paul is talking about an awesome transformation that has taken place in his heart when he came to faith in Jesus. Earlier in his life, Paul was all about what he could do to make himself look good to God and earn a way in heaven. But when he came to know and believe in Jesus, everything changed. All those things he put stock in, he saw them for what they were, nothing. In fact, he calls them rubbish. And when Paul met his Savior on the road to Damascus, he experienced the greatness of Christ. And as a result, Paul came to know Jesus' love, grace, forgiveness, and salvation. But also in the process, Paul saw who he really was. A sinner. A sinner who desperately needed a Savior. And Paul says in another book that he wrote that he is the chief of sinners. Do you know how you can get that type of mentality? When you know the greatness of Christ and you see your sin and you see how much you need Jesus. And Paul was right when he said he lost all things for Christ. At this time, he was sitting under house arrest. Any academic prestige where wealth he accumulated was gone. But it didn't matter to Paul because he had Jesus and a righteousness from God that came through faith. And that's what was truly important now and for eternity. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, we gain that same perspective. God's word reveals the truth and we see who we really are. Sinners who have disobeyed God many times and have fallen short of his commands. Sinners who, if we didn't have a Savior, there would be no hope. But Jesus changed all of that, didn't he? 
because of Jesus' perfect life, death, and resurrection, that all changes. You have been forgiven. And like the Apostle Paul, we know and believe through Christ, we have a righteousness from God that comes through faith. Because through faith in Jesus, he gives you his righteousness. And what that means is that you stand before God as someone who is holy and perfect, as his child. Because Christ has paid the punishment for all of our sins, every single one of them, so that you could be at peace with God. Righteousness that could only come through Christ. Righteousness that means there's an eternal home for you in heaven. There is nothing greater than this. It's like the parable Jesus told about the man who found a treasure and then sold everything he had so that he could buy that field. Let nothing get between you and Christ. The gospel, the righteousness that is ours through faith in Jesus, that is the greatest treasure. Nothing in this world can compare to knowing Jesus and being found in him. Because through Christ, every day you have this certainty. You are forgiven, you are a child of God, you are at peace. Not because of anything we have done, but because of what Christ has done for us. So we live for him. We live in joy and confidence because, like the Apostle Paul, we know the surpassing greatness of Christ. We live with certainty and hope because Jesus is greater than me. And for that, we rejoice. Amen. We continue with the prayer of the church and the Lord's Prayer. We bow our heads in prayer. Dear Jesus, we thank you for giving to us the greatest treasure in our lives, the gift of the gospel, which has shown us forgiveness of our sins and eternal life in heaven. Help us, Lord, to hold that truth close to our hearts and and make it the most important aspect of our lives. Uh, Lord, in, in a world of selfishness in me, we can be distracted and think that who we are and what we have done makes us greater to you. But help us to see the truth that we are sinners who greatly need your grace and forgiveness. Help us, Lord, uh, to see that truth, but more importantly, to find comfort and encouragement in your word, that with you there's certainty, there is a future in heaven, with you there is hope and forgiveness, that we are your child, and that one day we will be with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And we join in the prayer our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive with believing hearts the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Thank you once again for joining us in online worship today. We appreciate you coming together with us and join in praising our God. If you enjoyed today's message, uh, please click a thumbs up on our YouTube video or feel free to share it on social media as well as we and strive to share the good news of Christ with our community, with our family and friends. Before we leave this morning, there's just one announcement for you. Today is our VBS pickup for our online or virtual VBS program. Uh, if you come to church this afternoon between 4 and 6, you can pick up your child's kit. Uh, we just meet in the parking lot and they'll be handed to you that day. So if uh, you register your child, we'll see you later later this afternoon and hope that you enjoy this awesome VBS program. We thank everyone for all the hard work that they have put in uh, to make this possible. Uh, those are all the announcements I have today. Uh, thank you once again for joining us and may we remember that each day is a gift of God's grace to us.